if they're using the word exchequer in 11.10, the exchequer itself has got to have existed. It predates that date. What was it? It appears that it was more of an event in its early forms. On an annual basis, public accountants, predominantly the sheriffs, would have to have their accounts heard at the annual audit. Audit, obviously, Latin for hearing. Now, that's where we get the word exchequer from. The black and white exchequer cloth that was laid over the exchequer table on which the accounts were laid out. The barons of the exchequer would formally charge, in a legal sense, those who were responsible for collecting the king's money. And the lead man was the justicia. He was the personal representative of the king, essentially. He was entrusted with the responsibility to ensure the money was paid in correctly. Around the table sat all of the barons and other members of the court, and at the end of the table sat the sheriff who was having his account heard. If his account tallied, he was acquitted. This is the MMT Podcast with Patricia Pino and Christian Riley. Hi, I'm Christian Riley, and welcome to the Modern Monetary Theory Podcast. You can find us on Twitter at MMT Podcast, and you can support the show by going to patreon.com slash MMT Podcast. If this is your first time hearing about MMT, you might want to listen to our first three episodes for an introduction, which I've linked to in the show notes, along with some other things that relate to this particular episode. And as ever, I've linked to where you can support this podcast financially via patreon.com slash MMT podcast. Support starts at a dollar a month or a pound a month or whatever the equivalent is wherever you live. We're 100% listener funded. Your financial support support really helps keep the show going and your support in other ways, whether it's by recommending us to other people or just by listening and spreading the word about this stuff really helps too. A big thank you to all of our supporters so far and thanks as ever for the time you put into understanding MMT. Let's dive in. Welcome one and all to the MMT podcast. I'm Christian Riley, And I'm Patricia Pino. And we are delighted to be joined today by one of the co-authors of An Accounting Model of the UK Exchequer, but more recently, the author of a fantastic chapter in the new Gower Initiative book, MMT Key Insights Leading Thinkers. It's our pleasure to welcome back to the show, Richard Tai. Hi, Richard. Thanks for inviting me. Nice to be here. So, Richard, your chapter, which is entitled Credit and the Exchequer Since the Restoration, is a short history of government finance since the restoration, including how the Bank of England came into being and how it evolved, if that's the right word, into its current shape. But before we get into that, can you tell our listeners why you thought this story was so important to get out there? So, really just to put everything in terms of the modern system, into a historical context. So when Andrew and I first set out on researching the accounting model, we agreed that Andrew would focus on the modern literature and I would focus on the old literature. I already had an interest in it as I'd read books like Christine de Sand's book, Making Money. I'd also read a history of the Bank of England. And that gave insights and lots of references to other material, primary source material, parliamentary reports, etc., a lot of which I eventually got hold of myself. So it became a kind of hobby of collecting all these things together and reading through them and trying to unpick the workings of the system. Therefore, when it came to writing the accounting model, I added a lot of the appendices to it about the history of the system. And when it came to the GIMS asking about, could we contribute chapters I thought that the history was a very fitting lead-in to the modern system and giving it context. And it uncovers a lot of the the language used in the modern Acts of Parliament. I mean, particularly we talk about the Exchequer and Audit Departments Act 1866. There are a lot of bits of language in there, phrases, words that come from the ancient system. And even today, there are vestiges of the ancient system in the modern system in terms of people, positions within government, the Bank of England. So I just thought it was a very fitting thing to do and yeah, and hopefully it stimulates some interest. It is great to read where it all came from and see history rhyming, as they say. In the chapter, you start the story in the era of what's called free minting. Now, when was that and what was that? 
Okay, so we've got to really talk about the history of a sterling coin. So we're going way back to 8th century, essentially. And if we take a step back even further, we know from various charters that exist that pre-8th century English kings accepted contributions of tribute in kind. So you're talking things like livestock, cheese, butter, honey, but obviously it had limits. And at some point, a more sophisticated system came into being and the record of sterling then appears around about the late 8th century under King Offa, who was King of Mercia, the offer of Offa's Dyke. So the pound sterling came into being as a unit of account in basically Anglo-Saxon times. And there has been no break in pricing in pounds, shillings and pence since that time. It's a continuous history. Was that originally based on silver, by the way? Yes, it was. Yes. So the coinage was minted from silver, essentially. And come to that in a second. So in the early days, the only denomination in circulation was the silver penny. And it's a unit of account that begins as soon as it's accepted by count or by tail and face value, not by the weight or the fineness of the silver contained in the coin. So they were counted units of value that enabled, I suppose, relative pricing of goods and services. So when it comes to the free minting system, we have to move forward from the 8th century and come up into really the time of the 12th century, so under King Henry II. So free minting was introduced as he reformed the system of minting. It was a very decentralized system prior to that. And so he centralized it, reducing the number of mints. Memory serves me right, there were probably more than 50. And by the time he died, there were only, I think, about nine or 10 in the system. He also eliminated all of the ecclesiastical mints. How we then have to move forward further still, about another century, to the surviving records, which begin under King Edward I, 1279. So free minting was a system that effectively set a price at the Royal Mint for silver bullion in minted coins. So what does that mean? The Royal Mint effectively offered to buy as much silver bullion as people brought into it. So in exchange for silver bullion, the Mint paid newly minted coins. They charged a fee, of course, which was deducted from the total number of coins minted. So in effect, I think it's true to say that the sovereign was selling money for silver bullion. And individuals could then take that money and transact, trade, buy and sell in both the public and private economy. So according to the mint records of the time, a tower pound of silver bullion produced 243 pennies with a fineness close to about 93%. The mint would charge a fee of 12 pennies and that charge was paid to the king and the money minted and the individual had 231 pennies returned and that was how the free minting system worked and it worked for several centuries up until the 17th century when free minting ended and in effect the state started paying for the minting of coins. One little addition to that, at this time in 1279 and later, we see the introduction of not only the penny, but also the farthing, which was a quarter penny, and a groat, which was worth four pennies. It's important to state, and it will come in later to our conversation, that obviously the coinage that was produced had to be of a certain quality. There were very, very strict standards that the money is had to work to. And in order to test the quality of the coinage, it used to undergo, and actually still does, the trial of the picks. So it's still conducted today at the Royal Mint to test coinage, although I suspect it's probably just a sort of vestigial ceremonial procedure that has no real meaning. But at that time, it did. And if the proportion of silver in the coinage did not adhere to the standard then it was disqualified as being the king's money and the money was in trouble, essentially. Literally say that that's counterfeit now. Yes, indeed. Yeah. And so I suspect that person probably didn't have much long to live. <laughs> <laughs> so this effectively is like a silver standard, isn't it? Yes, it is indeed. And so we've had essentially the history of English and UK coinage 
has been a metallic standard for the majority of its history, right back to the 7th century, sorry, 8th century. And obviously there were two periods during which the standard was rescinded, during the Napoleonic Wars and during World War I. And then finally, the metallic standard was abandoned in 1931. So do we know what predated that silver standard? Yes, yeah, so the person who writes about it, that I certainly have a record of, is Christine de Sain in her book, Making Money. And she talks about how um, they weren't necessarily minting coin. What they were doing was they were renovating the coin that existed. So it was a remnant of the Roman times and of Roman money, but also European money that was coming in from the continent. And so if memory serves, and again, I'm happy to be taken to task by it, but if I remember rightly, that's predominantly what was going on. They were basically reminting money that came in from the continent and using those. So this is a little bit like today being a dollarized economy, maybe, <laughs> just like your money comes from elsewhere. Yeah, indeed. I'm not sure, actually, because from what I've read on that topic, a lot of that money was actually coming from Spain. And Spain, of course, obtained a lot of silver from Latin American mines. Yeah, they just discovered it, right? Yeah, they discovered it and they did us a favour, obviously, by <laughs> discovering it for us. But basically, Spain, as a result of that, and this goes a little bit into kind of the development of Spain versus the development of Britain. And correct me and intercede whenever you want, Richard, but I think that the Spanish basically focused on extracting silver from Latin America, using that silver effectively for imports and not really industrialize in Spain as much. Whereas Britain, on the other hand, was getting that silver from and exporting and doing all this trade and kind of industrializing more. So there was an influx of silver to Britain as a result of that. And I've obviously studied it from an inflation perspective. And I read that this influx may have caused some problems in terms of the value that was fluctuating quite dramatically. Is there any truth in that? I think that, yes, anecdotally, I think there is. I couldn't give you any details because it hasn't really been part of what I've studied. But anecdotally, I think that's correct. The thing that underpins English money, as it was at that time, was the fact that the English were very strict in trying to maintain the standard, the mint standard. And so they, you know, the argument being that if you maintain the standard, it makes the ability of money to move from the centre out into the peripheral economy and back again much more likely. And the English were masters at it, as, as far as I can see. And that really comes from de Sands and her writings, which point to that. It's interesting because I think there is still a debate to this day about the nature of money. And there are a lot of competing ideas. And I think when you have the system of people buying money with bullion and paying for it. They have to actually, literally, they are charged a fee for getting liquidity. Those were blurred when the king suddenly decided that the state would pay for minting in the 1660s. And then you get the whole debate from the late 1600s under John Locke, who, according to Dessin and other scholars, were those responsible for pushing this idea of sound money, of money as a commodity, rather than money as credit. Because I see these coins as credit, as collateralized credit, essentially collateralized with the silver. It's the stamp. It's not the commodity content. But to give you, I mean, this is really interesting. There's a beautiful quote. I'm just look through one of my books here. I have a book called The History of the Pound Sterling. I think it was written in the 1920s, I believe. Yeah, 1931, it was published. And the first chapter begins. This is really interesting. So I'll, I'll, let me read here. He was required to define what he meant by the pound. His answer was, I find it difficult to explain it, but every gentleman in England knows it. The committee repeated the question, and Mr. Smith answered, It is something that has existed without variation in this country for 800 years, 300 years before the introduction of gold. And it goes on. Thus, Peel, and this is MP Peel, quoted in the House of Commons in 1819 the evidence of a London accountant given before the committee on the resumption of cash payments. So this was post the Napoleonic Wars when they were talking about the resumption of cash payments at the Bank of England and introducing the gold standard. He quoted it only to ridicule it, for Peel had come to the conclusion from which he never departed that the pound sterling could only rightly be defined 
as a definite quantity of gold bullion. So they've got it wrong, even back then, essentially. And I think that that's a really a beautiful picture of how the English get money wrong. And even to this day, we're having the same debates about what is money. <laughs> Well, okay. So to that end, let's get right to the year 1110 AD. The Exchequer comes into being. What is the Exchequer, Richard, and how does it come into being? That's a long story. <laughs> Honestly, take your time, go around the houses. We love it. Let's have a look. So the ancient Exchequer effectively was an office or offices that came about from the early post-Norman conquest. So at that time, you had the King's Council, which I think is pronounced the Curia Regis, which was an institution within the heart of the King's Court that served as an administrative council, and it coordinated the business of the English state, if you like, discharging judicial duties, financial duties, and staffed by people close to the King, senior people, barons, etc., and members of the King's household. So that was the sort of the nascent institution. And there were two couriers, as far as I know, the greater courier and the lesser courier. The greater courier, I believe, became later parliament, and the lesser courier became the privy council. But what the king had, obviously, in his possession, he had valuable prized possessions, treasure, essentially. And that treasure consisted of jewellery, important documents, and, of course, coined money in which he obviously transacted. And so what you see if you read the records is that there's a conflation of treasury and treasure. And so if you strip them out, we need to think about jeweled treasure and money treasure. And so it was about trying to come up with a system to administer the financial affairs of the king. And so if we move from that sort of early post-Norman conquest period, we come into the sort of early 1100s. And the records are scanned. However, the first recorded use of the word exchequer dates to 1110, which is, well, that's 44 years after the Norman Conquest. The earliest written financial records that exist, as far as the exchequer is concerned, is a set of exchequer pipe rolls, and I'll come to those later on when we're talking about the, sort of the books of the exchequer, and they date to 1129, 1130. But it's only when we move forward to 1155, 1156, that we get to an unbroken financial record that stretches from that period, 1155, all the way through until 1832. So we know, therefore, that if they're using the word exchequer in 1110, then the exchequer itself, as some kind of institution, has got to have existed. It predates that date. It has to. So how did it come about, or rather, what was it? The record shows, I think, that it would be a mistake to think of the Exchequer as an office that existed centred in some location. It appears that it was more of an event in its early forms. And by an event, what I mean by it is that on an annual basis, public accountants, predominantly the sheriffs, would have to have their accounts heard at the annual audit. And so the exchequer was set up and the accounts were heard by the barons of the exchequer, essentially. If we move forwards and get to more sort of definitive records, the office of the exchequer and its modes of practice were the creation of Roger of Salisbury, who was the Lord Chancellor of Henry I. And it was under his leadership that the administrative system that defined the accounting, the type of accounting is called charge and discharge, that the people who worked in the exchequer, the whole system was set up by him. So we're talking in the mid-1100s, essentially. And that system lasted through until 1834. It went through various evolutions, but it effectively was extant until it was completely abandoned. And the exchequer today no longer exists as a separate office. There are vestiges, as I said earlier. So the system that he set up is described in a fantastic treatise, which is called The Dialogue of the Exchequer, which was written by Richard Fitzneil in 1177. And it's a unique administrative treatise, a great historical work. It was written in Latin, 
and it details the workings of the exchequer, the officers presiding there, talks about the collection of revenue, the keeping of money, and the issuing of money, and also importantly, the auditing of accounts. It's called a dialogue because that's exactly what it was. It was a colloquy between, effectively, questions and answers between a student and his master. And Richard Fitzneil was the king's treasurer under Henry II. He went on to become Bishop of London, I believe, until he died in about 1200. And so from his account, we get detailed descriptions of how it actually worked. So that the exchequer was divided into two courts. There was the upper exchequer and the lower exchequer. The upper exchequer was established as a court of audit whose function was to scrutinise effectively the financial accounts of public accountants. It's very legal in the sense that, and actually from the upper exchequer, we do get the English judicial system essentially is part of it. And so the language associated with it, associated with charge, discharging accountant, has very strong legal connotations. So at the beginning of a financial year, the barons of the exchequer would charge, formally charge, in a legal sense, those who were responsible for collecting the king's money. And the upper exchequer was the court in which the audits of those accounts were heard. So audit, obviously, Latin for hearing. So at the end of the financial year, the public accountants would have their accounts heard. And if those accounts were as they should be, then the public accountant was acquitted. He was discharged. The other office was where the money, the lower exchequer, or the exchequer of receipt, that was where receipt of money was undertaken. It was deposited, it was kept, and it was issued. So the officers in the exchequer of receipt counted the money, they checked it, it was weighed, etc. It was recorded and it was notched on tally sticks, which we'll talk about later. So there's a beautiful saying about it. What was found in the upper exchequer to be due was paid in the lower. And what had been paid in the lower was accounted for in the upper. So it was a sort of system that beautifully circular and it was self-checking essentially. If we look at the upper exchequer, the people who presided over the upper exchequer were what the dialogue describes as the king's barons and the great men. And they oversaw the process of the audit on the exchequer table, upon which was laid the exchequer cloth. Now, that's where we get the word exchequer from. It's from the exchequer, the black and white exchequer cloth that was laid over the exchequer table, on which the accounts were laid out at the audit. And the lead man was the justicia, and he oversaw, he was the personal representative of the king, essentially, and he effectively, he was entrusted with the responsibility to ensure that, that the money was paid in correctly. It was his role. And around the table sat all of the barons and other members of the court. And at the end of the table sat the sheriff who was having his account heard. And if his account tallied, then he was acquitted, essentially. There are, in terms of the lower exchequer, we can have a look at, I think it's more interesting in the sense that it leads into the later sort of money system, i.e. the Bank of England and other aspects so it's more relevant to what we probably want to talk about. But to talk about some of the officers who presided in the exchequer of receipt, we have the tellers. So they were the ones that told the money, i.e. they counted it in and they counted it out, essentially. We also have in the exchequer of receipt a little court called the tally court. And in the tally court presided chamberlains and their deputies. And their business, if you like, was one of cutting the tallies, essentially which we'll come to in a bit. So they would basically receive from the tellers of the exchequer who received the money, they would receive a bill that was basically thrown down a pipe into the tally court, and they would take that bill, which was written on parchment, recording the amount of money that had been paid in, and it would then be written into various books by the auditor of the exchequer and or his deputy, and also recorded in separate books by the clerk of the Pells, and a tally would be struck, essentially. And that was the responsibility of the Chamberlains. Also, in the Exchequer of Receipt, you have the Exchequer Chests, which are still relevant today to a certain degree. They were presided over by the Clerk of the Pells, um, the Auditor of the Exchequer, and the Tellers, each of which had one key to each chest. Each Teller, and there were four of them, had a chest. And so there were three keys 
and they would be able to open the chest at the end of the day and either take money in or leave it in to be stored overnight for the next day. So there's a lot going on there, but it's a really interesting and long story. But we still see, as I said before, vestiges of that old system in today's system. Well, you touched on it there. We've been teasing this since the beginning of the episode. <laughs> and this is like one of my favorite things about the history of money in terms of the actual debt and credit instruments being used at the time. And the way you put it is England's economy was based on twigs. <laughs> so tell us all about these twigs. So again, this is a long story, but it needs to be teased out because it is actually very interesting. So, well, what is a tally stick? A tally stick, as I've alluded to, was effectively an accounting device. It was a record of money paid in to the exchequer. Now, you can imagine we're talking about a time of near universal illiteracy. Numeracy obviously probably wasn't very good either. And so you had a very visual, physical record of what had gone on. Not only that, it was also encrypted in the sense that you not only had matching notches, but you also had matching grain of wood. So it's very difficult to counterfeit. So the tally was an accounting device, essentially, struck by the chamberlains of the tally court in the Exchequer of Receipt. And it was a duplicate record of an amount of money paid in by public accountants. As I said earlier, under the system of charge and discharge accounting, what a public accountant would do is he was summoned to the Exchequer twice a year, once at Easter for an interim payment, and which was known as the proffer, and a final payment at Michaelmas, so end of September. And also the Michaelmas summons was where he would have his accounts heard. So a tally stick that he'd received would be presented at the audit, and that would be part of his legal acquittance, proof of payment essentially, formally discharging the tax collector from the taxes he owed the king. So we've spoken a little bit about how money was paid in that coinage would be presented to the tellers, the tellers would write it in what was known as the waste book, they would write a bill on a piece of parchment that would then be thrown down the pipe into the tally court, the tally stick would be struck. So it was made from a hardwood, hazelwood. It was rectangular in profile, so if you cut it across its length, essentially, or sorry, through its length, you would have a profile that was rectangular. And it varied in length. Some of them were three and a half, four inches long, and then latterly some of them were well over five feet long. So if you look at the profiles, if we think about the profile, the rectangular profile, you'll have two short sides, top and bottom, the top being the obverse and the bottom being the reverse side, and obviously you've got two sides left and right. On the obverse side and the reverse side, you had notches cut into the stick, and they were basically to express the monetary value of the payment that the public accountant had made. So the dialogue, um, the dialogue of the exchequer, details the strict rules according to which the notches were cut. So they were cut parallel to each other on the obverse and reverse sides, so perpendicular to the tally's long axis, and grouped according to denomination. The dialogue says, and this is quite wonderful actually, the notch denoting a thousand pounds at that time was cut to the width of a palm of a hand, and the notch for a hundred pounds was the width of a thumb. Twenty pounds was the width of a little finger, and one pound the width of fat barley corn. And one penny was essentially just a single cut. <laughs> Don't bring me any of your slim barley corn, please. <laughs> I want a fat barley corn. You'd be glad to know that later on, inches were substituted as a unit of measure, so it um, <laughs> became a little bit more scientific. But effectively, what you had was the notches on the obverse side, so the top side, expressed the principal money value of the tally. So if you had a tally for, say, I don't know, £230, for example, the top side, the obverse side, would have two notches for £200, and the remaining lower value denominations would go on the bottom, on the reverse side. So once the notches had been cut on both sides of the tally, details were scribed on either side of the stick, such as name, date, etc., and other details, and that was written in Exchequer Latin. And that was a thing. The Exchequer had a really archaic system that lived on all the way through right until the end. 
they wrote in their own type of Latin, which is totally indecipherable as far as I'm concerned. I don't speak much Latin anyway. Was it Boris Johnson Latin? It was even more <laughs> esoteric than that, I think. <laughs> this is shocking to me, people involved in finance using esoteric language. <laughs> 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 it's, uh, could it possibly be to obfuscate anything? <laughs> Making things obscure there? No. Indeed. So from there, what they then did was they would make a short cut, a vertical cut made halfway through the thickness of the tally. I'm creating effectively a cross cut. And then the tally was cut lengthways through the notches to the cross cut, basically splitting the stick into two unequal lengths, effectively creating a duplicate record of the notches. Okay, So the longer portion of the tally stick was called the stock and here we're getting into some interesting language. And the shorter portion, the foil, or the tally and counter tally. The stock was handed to the public accountant, and the foil was kept by the exchequer. Later on, when it came to the public accountant having his account heard in the upper exchequer at Michaelmas, the stock and the foil were rejoined. And if they matched, then the public accountant got his credit, and he was acquitted of the payment that was due, essentially. And so... That was what originally tally sticks were. They were a receipt, a proof of payment. However, there are some nuances to it. So when it came to, and this is really important because it feeds into the idea of stock, we think in modern terms of stock being stocks and shares of companies. Well, original stock was the stock portion of the tally, and it represented the prepayment of taxes, okay? And so effectively, what you have there is you have original stock. This is government stock. This is a share of UK PLC back in the 12th century, okay? Which is really interesting. And you think about tax return, or you think of rate of return. This is where all this language comes from, because effectively, the public accountant is returning his tax to the upper exchequer to have his account heard. So all of this feeds through into contemporary finance. Just to inject a bit of MMT there, and like you say, you can pay your taxes with a tally stick, right? Yep. And so in trying to make a modern day equivalent or trying to draw parallels with MMT, we, we would say money is what the sovereign demands in payment of taxes. So we can call this money, right? That's a bit of a stretch, but I see where you're coming from because effectively the money's already been paid. So in the ancient system, the coinage has been handed over. And so in this sense, it is credit, essentially. You have credit at the audit when it comes to its proof of payment, essentially. We can add a little bit to this in the sense that when the coinage was paid over, there were various ways in which it was accepted or not accepted, as the case may be. So, for example, there are three ways that the exchequer accepted it, either what was called ad scalum, ad pensum, or ad fazor. Now, ad scalum was effectively, the assumption was that the money that was being handed in was defective in some way. So obviously it had come from the mint where it had undergone the trial of the picks and qualified as the king's money, but had been circulating in the economy and potentially had been clipped or damaged or worn. And so when it came to the king accepting the money back in taxes, he wanted to make sure that what he was getting was the real McCoy, essentially. And so if it was a payment ad scalum, what would happen is that a set sum had to be added to the payment being made to make up for what was deemed to be defective, essentially. If we then move forward to ad pensum, what happened was that it was the money came in, it was weighed, and if a set number of coins, say 243 coins, was weighed and it didn't weigh one pound, then additional coins had to be added to the pile in order to make up the amount, essentially. Thirdly, we have a system of payment called ad fazor, which is where the money is taken in, but it's actually blanched. It's melted down again into an ingot so that they can actually test the silver fineness and compare it to a standard pound weight. Now, what this meant was that when it came to tally sticks being cut, that a memorandum tally was first given until the trial of melting it down had been conducted and the fineness of the coin being paid was tested. 
And so the memorandum tally was an interim. Then when it'd been tested and it was deemed good and the deficiency made up, as it were, then the memorandum tally was destroyed and a tally of sol, a salutum that stands for, which is basically, um, if you like, dissolved, I've paid, was the term given to it. And you read those in the pipe rolls. A tally of sol was cut and to it was appended a combustion tally which recorded the amount of coin that was lost through the melting process. So these are little things that are added on to add detail to it. Now, the tally evolves through time as the sort of administrative system evolves, becomes more complex. But also, as we've already alluded to, the system was reliant on having silver coin. And if you didn't have silver coin, then you were in trouble. So how did the king get around this problem? Well, he knows that he's got people, sheriffs, in the countryside collecting taxes on his behalf, and they will have money in their possession. So when somebody sells goods to the king, let's say a crate of wine, for example, the king obviously wants to make payment, but he doesn't have the coin in his possession in the exchequer to make that payment. So initially what happened was he wrote a writ of liberate, it was called. So that would basically enable the tellers at the exchequer to issue an order to the sheriff, a written order to the sheriff, when presented to the sheriff by the creditor, i.e. the person who had sold the king wine, that would be presented to the sheriff and the sheriff would then hand over the money to the value of the wine that had been tendered to the king. And then when it came to the sheriff returning to the exchequer to have his accounts heard, he obviously presented a writ of liberate and that would give him credit for his account. We then move forward and that system was abandoned to create what were known as tallies of pro. And the tally of pro became the instrument of payment. So the tally of pro was struck pro, as it were, i.e. on the sides of the tally were written the public accountant, i.e. the sheriff, to whom the tally had to be presented and payment made to the wine seller, shall we say. Now, the difference with that is the fact that with the tally of Sol, what we have is we have effectively, when payment of coin is made into the exchequer, it goes into the receipt books. However, when a tally of pro is written, it's written not only into the receipt books, but it's also written into the issue books simultaneously. But what it's doing is it's recording a transaction that takes place outside of the exchequer. Okay? And so the tally of pro effectively is like a check. It's handed to the wine seller. He then presents it to the sheriff in the countryside. The money's handed over in terms of he's cashing the check with the sheriff. And then the sheriff later on produces the tally of pro saying, I've paid. But the important thing is the writing in of not only of receipt, but it's also recording issue, even though receipt and issue has not happened in the exchequer and it doesn't happen. So the exchequer effectively becomes a clearinghouse at a later date of tallies of pro. And you find, and Dessin writes about it beautifully, saying that effectively there are more transactions in tallies of pro in the exchequer than there are of coin. And it shows you the importance of the system of tally pro that gets the king off the hook because he doesn't have the money in the exchequer. The money's out in the countryside doing what it should do, essentially transacting. And so the exchequer is basically a clearinghouse for tallies. So you would call that money? Yes. Yeah, I, effectively, yes. It's like a modern check, essentially. Yeah, I think in the book you call it a wooden check, which... <laughs> yeah, it is. Yeah, essentially. And it's what's really interesting is that... It doesn't bounce. No, precisely. And so... <laughs> This is written not only by, and this is the beauty of it, is the fact that if you read this sound and you then read all of her footnotes, she references lots of internal reports, government reports. And you can then go online, and if you have access to a university library, you can find these things. And so there are some reports, for example, there is the Public Income and Expenditure Report. And in that, and that was written in 1869, there's an Appendix 13, which is about 220 pages long. And it details everything about government expenditure and income up to that point. All of the instruments that government has used up until that point, including tally sticks. And it goes through a detailed description of the tally stick system, which underpins exactly what I'm saying and underpins all the other writers. So even internal documents describe it as that which is really, really interesting. You mentioned that there's a lot of this system is still sort of remains in the 
exchequer system of the UK. And I think you've already mentioned that a lot of the terms that were used at the time are still in use. But is there more that remains from that system? Effectively, yes. So I mentioned the exchequer chests in which the tellers effectively kept their money. Again, they were under charge as well. So whatever money they had in their possession, they were formally charged and then later discharged when they had issued money. So when we move forward and talk about the Bank of England and its role in financing government and helping government to make payments, receive payments, when the exchequer was abolished in 1834, effectively, the account of His Majesty's exchequer was set up at the bank. And that was effectively the account of the tellers, essentially, i.e. it is the teller's chest because it basically holds the residual of government spending and receipt on a daily basis. Albeit now the system is slightly more sophisticated in that we have an exchequer sweep that sweeps that money, whatever it might be, up into other accounts. But effectively, the account of His Majesty's Exchequer is effectively the teller's chest. Similarly, if we look at the officers of the Exchequer of Receipt, we have the auditor who sat in the tally court who would not only record receipt of payments and then order a tally stick, but he would also receive writs from the king, warrants, letters, patent to order payment. So the auditor of the Exchequer is today the comptroller and auditor general who sits in the National Audit Office. The tellers of the Exchequer became tellers at the bank. And so these things still exist, essentially, but we don't think about them as part of the ancient system. But by reading the history, you see those connections. Because you touched on it there, maybe we should move on to that. And well, actually, before we get to the Bank of England, in 1672, there was this event known as the Great Stop of the Exchequer. So when Charles II came to the throne in the 16, in 1660, I think it would be, he had a problem because he was fighting the Dutch, essentially, and he was short of money. So one of his members of his government a chap called George Downing, who is the person Downing Street is named after. He basically was a great financial innovator, and he put together what became known as the tally of loan and treasury order system. So another evolution of the tally stick was the tally of loan. Now, we have to also understand that this is probably the first time that an act of parliament was passed that basically raised revenue for the crown in order to pay, to be hypothecated, set aside to pay certain debts. And they're associated with the tally of loan and the treasury order system. So George Downing basically instituted this system whereby the government needed to borrow money. We have a system at the time, obviously, it was based upon a silver standard and silver was short of coin. We can't get hold of money. And so we need to force money to the exchequer. So how do you do that? You basically issue a favourable loan that allows you to charge or pay interest. So the tally of loan and treasury order system was set up to invite subscriptions, money into the exchequer that the exchequer could then spend on fighting the Dutch Anglo wars. So what happened was people paid money into the exchequer and whenever you paid money into the exchequer, a tally was struck. And this was called a tally of loan. And it represented the amount of money that you had subscribed to the loan or that you had lent to the government. On the side of that, in order to give security to those subscribers, a treasury order was drawn up. Now, a treasury order was just a piece of paper that basically said, we will pay you this amount of money. And each treasury order was numbered in order of payment, i.e. so if you were the first to pay a first subscriber, you were number one on the list. And then all the subsequent subscribers, one, two, three, four, five, six, and so on. So that would basically order the payment or the paying off of the loan. So if you had number one, you were first in the queue. So when the taxes came in, you would go to the exchequer and present your treasury order and you would be repaid. So it was a system that effectively enabled and gave security to people who were lending money to the exchequer which obviously the king needed to prosecute the war and build a naval fleet, etc. And when you talk about their lending money to the government, are they lending coined money, not bullion? No, it's coin. It's already coined money. So this system was instituted. And then as it went forward, other acts of parliament were issued 
that extended the system, so the tally of loan and treasury on the system. And what we find is that the system became abused. And so what happened was that the exchequer was effectively issuing treasury orders to the government's paymasters. And the paymasters would then use those as credit out amongst the nascent goldsmith bankers. And they would raise loans based upon what were known as fiduciary orders. And so the government just started issuing these fiduciary orders, but with no taxes as security for repayment. And so they were just issued on general taxation, not on specific hypothecated taxes according to Acts of Parliament. And so the system just became completely oversubscribed. And when it came to the goldsmith bankers, uh, who ha ended up holding a lot of these fiduciary orders, coming to the exchequer for payment, the exchequer couldn't pay, essentially. Now, I wrote about it in the accounting model at the end, and it's an interesting story because it's shown as an example of the fact that the government actually defaulted. Well, it was the king that defaulted because government, or rather parliament, hadn't instituted national debt at that point. Parliament didn't have control of the government finances as they came to after the sort of constitutional rearrangement that occurred in 1688 with obviously the glorious revolution, essentially deposing of James II and William of Orange came in. So there's a lot of debate as to whether the government had actually defaulted. And I don't think it's true to say that's the case on balance. Yes, it was a default, but it was a default by the king. However, it wasn't a default across the board. The tally of loan and treasury order system continued working in the background. And indeed, some of the payments that were required on the fiduciary orders were made. However, they were suspended and then brought back in. But then the king wrote what are known as letters patent, which are open letters, essentially, stating that he would make payment at some point. And so the stop of the exchequer, as it came to be known, is obviously infamous for the king effectively defaulting on the fiduciary orders. But later on, there was a court case called uh, the case of the bankers. And so there was an agreement eventually meted out such that those that had suffered the king's default would be paid. And indeed, pretty much everything was paid back, but it wasn't fully redeemed until well into the 1700s. This makes me think about the closing of the gold window in the 70s. <laughs> it's just, they learned by then, instead of going, okay, we're broke, they just went, we just decided like dollars are worth dollars now. Precisely. And, so, and that's what's really interesting about it is the fact that if you think about it, had they just made fiduciary orders payable in taxes, then the system would have worked and the goldsmiths could have just handed them in and their tax accounts would have been credited. But they didn't do that. They didn't think about that. And of course, what you have here effectively is the exchequer acting as a bank, issuing effectively money in the form of fiduciary orders. And if you take that thinking one step forward, if this system of fiduciary orders had worked, then there would be no need, as it later came about, for the Bank of England. The exchequer would have turned into a bank and the Bank of England would have never been a thing. Most probably, <laughs> which is a bit of a to do. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So we've got to this point now where it's like, okay, the Bank of England is born and this is 1694. Bank of England's established in 1694. And you write that the principal loan from the Bank of England to the government was 1.2 million pounds. And my question to you at that point was going to be, how did that work in nuts and bolts terms if that's the Bank of England's credit to the government, or I suppose the Treasury? I think I'm asking, did the government then have what we would call a reserve balance or something like that at the Bank of England? No. Okay. So what it was effectively, the incorporation of the Bank of England was by an act of parliament and it was, was what's known as a Ways and Means Act. Now, a Ways and Means Act is just an act that raises taxes. So just as described earlier, with the Tally of Loan Act, whereby taxes were raised and hypothecated towards paying the treasury orders, which were alongside the tallies of loans. It's a similar system. So the Ways and Means Act of 1694 basically granted His Majesty rates and duties on the tonnage of ships and upon deer and ale and other liquors, essentially. And with that, if you then go on reading below those clauses, it basically enables the incorporation of a bank 
to do the business of or the incorporation of a company to conduct the business of banking. Okay. And it invited the subscription of 1.2 million pounds and subscribers were buying stock of the bank. They were buying shares in the bank. So those that bought stock had a claim on the company, not on the government. And in return, the government in raising these taxes would pay an annuity to the bank. And that annuity amounted to £100,000 a year. So £96,000, which was 8% interest on a £1.2 million loan, and then management fees, an annual management fee of £4,000, bringing the perpetual annuity to £100,000 a year. So what happened was that as soon as the bank was incorporated, its shareholders had share certificates. Because it's a bank, it effectively wrote out notes and handed those notes to the exchequer which the exchequer then paid into circulation. So it paid creditors, essentially. And the asset of the bank was the loan, essentially, that the government had taken out, essentially. And that was what backed it. And it effectively, all it did was it just paid the interest on the loan. And the capital, the principal capital of the loan, could only be repaid by order of parliament. And so the act essentially gives the bank a charter for 11 years through until, which would be 1705 from 1694. And that would allow the bank to conduct the business of banking for 11 years. So it was a joint stock company and it was basically paid up share capital and dividends accrued to shareholders. But the bank had no power of control over the loan. That was only by act of parliament. And if government requested that the loan be repaid, then there would be a year's grace after which the corporation would cease to do business, essentially. So that, that was how it worked effectively. So in terms of money being transferred to the exchequer, it was effectively the bank's notes. So sealed bills and bank notes were handed into the exchequer and the exchequer basically spent them. Now, what's interesting is that it wasn't until 16... 98 and 1699 that two acts of parliament were passed that enabled the exchequer to accept the bank's bills in taxes okay so you can imagine that that would give great strength to the bank's notes and indeed it did but it was a temporary measure so it was only for a short period of time which the exchequer would accept the bank's notes in payment of taxes after which once those acts of parliament lapsed that was the end of the system, essentially. And it wasn't until a lot later, until 1816, the bank's notes were formally accepted at the exchequer in payment of taxes. At that time, why was it temporary? Were they experimenting? I think it was an expedient. So part of that period, there was a lot of financial problems going on, not least caused by the government's decision under the advice of people like John Locke and others to enact what was called the Great Recoinage. So there was great debate at that point as to whether money was the commodity or whether money was the count, essentially, i.e. the face value of the coin. And I'm afraid the commodity argument won over. And because the coinage had become debased in terms of its silver content and gold content, it was decided that we need to recall the coinage and we need to bring up the entire stock of coinage to the acceptable standard. And of course, as soon as you start calling in all the coin, well, there's no money in the economy. And so the economy basically goes pear-shaped. This is what paying off the national debt does. Yes, precisely. What was exactly the nature of that debate? Were there people who basically like charterlists would talk about money as a creature of the state versus money as a commodity? Or was it of a different nature? It was more about whether money is the underlying commodity or whether it's accepted by tail and whether we can accept a debased coinage, i.e. in terms of silver content, because we're not really interested in the silver content. It's the count, it's the face value, it's the stamp that matters. So my understanding, and this comes from reading De Sound, but it's interesting, I had a, a message from Neil Wilson earlier on today, forwarding another take on the argument about John Locke. De Sound argues that John Locke was the figure behind this thinking of sound money. And I think her argument runs along the lines of that John Locke worked in the international sphere. So why would that affect his thinking? If you think about it domestically, so if you think about coin traveling domestically, transacting domestically, it could only work if it transacts by tail. And indeed, that's exactly what it did. 
it would be face value because people out there, they don't have a set of scales to weigh money. They don't have a standard to compare it to. They can't melt coin down and compare it to some standards. So it has to travel by count. But if you move into the international realm, if you have a coin stamped with the English king's head and you live in France, it's worthless as a coin of the king of England. What you're interested in is the commodity content. And so if you're working along that border, as I understand John Locke once, working in the international sphere, you're going to see money as the underlying commodity, not the face value. And so I think that's perhaps, and I'm happy to be contradicted, I think that's probably part of the reasoning for his thinking that money is commodity. And it goes back into that quote that I gave you from the history of Sterling about Peel in Parliament. This, I mean, it just became completely infused English thinking. Money is the commodity. It's not a unit of account, a circulating unit of account. So that's where I think the debate was centred around. And Locke won the argument, and hence we had the Great Recoinage, which was devastating. It caused a lot of problems. But it led, as things always do, to innovation. And we come on to things like exchequer bills, which was a way of trying to supplement the money system until the recoinage had occurred and the money was basically pumped back out into the economy. This reminds me of people talking about, I know that Warren talks about when Russia shut off their central bank, they just turned the computers off in, I think, the 90s. So there was no activity happening. People just improvised and the businesses were trading what they called arrears. Yes, indeed. And it was the same, I think also there was a story that came out of Ireland, the Republic of Ireland back in the 70s, where everything, I think there were strikes. And so the banking system just shut down and everybody carried on transacting with checks. They just went to the bar and a check was written and that check just circulated. Yeah. And people innovated. And it was only until the banking system reopened that suddenly it was like, oh, well, we can start clearing things now. So, yeah, it's dangerous for banks to shut down, actually. Yeah. Quite. People start working the system out. Yeah, yeah. How little do yeah. we actually need you people? <laughs> so as I read it, there was this a very slow evolution in the relationship between the Bank of England and the Treasury over time. It wasn't codified in law from day one. Can you tell us about that? So that's really quite interesting because obviously it comes into today's system. So I wrote a few notes up earlier on today before we came on. So obviously what cemented the relationship first off was obviously the first loan of £1.2 million following the bank's incorporation. And you can then move on shortly after that because of the problems of the recoinage, because the government just didn't have credit worthiness out in the system. I mean, this is the terrible point that a commodity-based money system has. It makes the government permanently short. So there were lots of tallies of loan still circulating in the economy. However, they were circulating at huge discount, which was affecting the ability of the government to issue further tallies of loan. And so the Bank of England was instructed to go out and effectively buy them up. Now, this has almost an analogy. Okay, you could say perhaps it's bailing the government out, but it also, to my mind, it smacks of QE because the bank just goes out there and says, hey, we'll see that tally of loan. It has a face value of this. Well, we'll buy it. And of course, then all the tallies of loan that are sitting out there that are going at discount suddenly aren't going at discount and are transacting at face value. So even just the threat or the action of going out there and saying, yeah, we'll pay face value. And suddenly they come back to par. Yeah, it's yield curve control. Yeah, indeed. Yeah, absolutely. So there was that. And then I've mentioned also parliamentary acts that were passed that enabled payment of taxes temporarily in Bank of England notes, uh, sealed notes, and or sealed bills rather, and notes. And then we come on to, and I think you mentioned it in one of your questions, in your written questions about stock and the bank sort of issuing more stock. So because obviously the, the bank had now lots of tallies of loan, what happened was they basically engrafted those stock essentially onto the capital of the bank. So anybody who had ownership of a tally of loan Basically, an act of parliament was written stating that if you want to buy bank stock, Bank of England stock, you can use tallies of loan to do so. And so these tallies of loan were basically engrafted on as bank stock. So the capital of the bank increased. People subscribed to shares using tallies of loan. So it wasn't full bank stock. It was slightly different. And I can't remember the exact details. 
But if you look at the literature, they'll talk about engrafted stock, essentially, and they were tallies of loan that increased the capital of the bank. And there were, I think, also at that time, in the same act, you could buy bank stock using Bank of England notes as well. So this is the first time that you can suddenly use almost bank deposits to buy bank stock of the same bank. Yeah. yeah so yeah. this is yeah. quite interesting. So we then move on to, and we haven't quite touched on it, on to Exchequer Bills. Exchequer Bills came about earlier in the late 1690s as a supplementary currency, essentially. They were effectively liabilities of the Exchequer. People either subscribed money into the Exchequer and an Exchequer Bill paying interest was paid out. And they circulated from person to person. They could be used as money. And so the Exchequer would effectively issue them and they would circulate. And later iterations, I think the second iteration, they were allowed. So this is where the fiduciary orders are further developed. They are effectively fiduciary orders, but they get them right this time because you could pay your taxes in them. Are these like very liquid bonds then? Because of the interest bearing element. Yes, effectively. Yes. So people would say, oh, they circulated because they were interest bearing. Of course, I think from the MMT loans, you would say, well, we circulated because you could pay your taxes in them. Well, I mean, you could say this piece of paper, if you hang on to it, is worth more bits of paper, <laughs> right? And so that's really attractive to people. Precisely. <laughs> and then you have to go, but, well, why? <laughs> and then you have to answer the question, well, because they were good for payment of taxes and everybody needs to pay tax. Yeah. So you would present them, if you had a tax bill to pay, you could present them to the exchequer, pay in taxes, plus you can get interest. The exchequer would have to pay you the interest that you'd earned. So there's a bit of both there going on. But yeah, I mean, the MMT lens would say they circulated because you could pay your taxes, essentially. What was the point of issuing these things? I mean, just trying to think about the role of bonds today. It's nothing like that, is it? No. Because of the great recoinage that was taking place at the same time, there was no money circulating. So they had to think up ways of trying to force money out there. And exchequer bills were one way. Now, the way it was done was rather surreptitious because it was a clause that was written in by Charles Montague, who was Chancellor of the Exchequer at the time, into the act that was basically incorporating the National Land Bank, which was effectively a type of bank that would issue mortgages on land and property, essentially. And it was written in a similar vein to the Bank of England Act. It was all, almost identical. So it would raise taxes and the government would pay a perpetual annuity to the National Land Bank based upon a loan of £2.5 million pounds that it would pay into the Exchequer through the notes that the bank issued. But it failed to raise the subscription. It was a total failure in the sense that they wanted to raise £2.5 million. Pounds. I think they only raised about £7,000. Is the introduction of these pieces of paper a way of making money more endogenous so that you wouldn't have these crises developing? Well, it's exogenous in the sense that it's being pumped in by the government. Okay, so there's a shortage. Yes. And so if you think about the Bank of England and, say, the National Land Bank, when it's issuing loans to its customers... It's paying in paper, essentially. It's creating paper notes that it's paying these people. This is the loan, and you owe me, and I'll give you some deposits in the form of pieces of paper, which you can then go out and spend. But those pieces of paper are claims on coin because it was a convertible system. And so any notes or any other credit instruments issued by anybody was basically a claim on coin, ultimately. And if you couldn't pay coin then you were in default, essentially. But how strict were they? I mean, presumably, if they're trying to expand the money supply in this way, they're in trouble if everybody claims the coin at the same time. Yes, they were pretty strict. So if I remember rightly, the Bank of England Act restricted the amount of loans that the bank could issue. And I'm sure that was in order to protect its coinage, essentially. Because notes weren't the money. The legal money was coin, okay? So if you look at acts of parliament that talk about the legal money or king's lawful money, they're talking about coin, not about notes. But the exchequer bills are different in the sense that the exchequer wants to circulate bills. Yes, they are claims on coin, but you can actually pay your taxes with them. So it is a circulating medium of exchange that's good for taxes. 
So you could spend in exchequer bills and recoup taxes in exchequer bills and this kind of the fiscal loop is closed, essentially. So in a sense, they are money, but I guess the difference is that with the notes, there is a risk that you might not get your proper money. Yes. And also there's a risk if somebody, for example, is insisting that they want to cash their exchequer bills, i.e. get coined money for them, that there isn't any coined money, in which case you could say that's a default. But most people were happy to accept exchequer bills. Now, what's interesting about it is the fact that when exchequer bills were the sort of the second, third iteration of exchequer bills, because they still hadn't cottoned on to this idea about taxes being payable in exchequer bills, underpinning the system, they strove to contract, called they contracted with trustees who would circulate or aid the circulation of the exchequer bills. So what do I mean by that? What they did was they got people to subscribe coin to a group of trustees who would manage the coin and manage the circulation of the exchequer bills by enabling their encashment, essentially. So if people out in the economy had exchequer bills, there was a group of trustees who were on hand, if the exchequer couldn't, to cash them as required. And so there were a series of these contracts signed. I think there were about 16 in total between about 1696, 1697 and about 1709, 1710. And they were basically there in position to aid the exchequer to circulate them because they would enable encashment of them. But we then come to the end of those trustees and we find that the Bank of England takes on that subscription and it sets up what's known as the subscription for the circulation and it does exactly what the trustees do. It basically invites people to subscribe into a fund from which they gain an interest payment and they gain financially from it but they basically are holding a hoard of coin which can be used for circulating and cashing exchequer bills as and when demanded. So that shows you how the evolution of the Bank of England and the Exchequer stroke Treasury comes into being. It starts getting tighter and tighter as time goes by. And we find that another very interesting aspect to it, and this is where it feeds into the modern system. I read a Treasury Minute, which is dated 1711, where the bank is pleading with the Exchequer and the Treasury to ask public accountants to come and bank with them. Because if you're a public accountant, you obviously have a lot of coin on hand. And so the bank is trying to get them in to their bank to bank with them such that they have a constant influx of coin coming to them through the public accountants. And indeed, I've since found out, and I hadn't, it's only recently actually, that you find it written in various places actually, detailing the fact that public accountants did actually bank with the bank almost from the get-go. So you have the paymaster of the forces banking with the Bank of England and later other public accountants come in. And they held a lot of money with the bank, effectively, in, in cash, in coin. And we then come on to a very interesting aspect of the sort of close-knit relationship that develops with the bank, whereby we see the Bank of England sends a bank clerk. We don't know when it started, but it's in minutes of evidence given in 1780 and repeated later on in 1831, describing the fact that a bank clerk attends daily at the exchequer and effectively runs the accounts of the teller at the exchequer. And what they do is they, because all the public accountants, both the paymasters and the receivers of taxes, are banking with the bank, they basically make their payments through the bank. In order for the public accountants to pay money in, what they do is they go to the bank and they ask the bank to raise a cancelled banknote, debit their account, and then they take the cancelled banknote to the exchequer and hand it to the bank clerk attending in the exchequer, who then makes a record of it and credits the tellers of the exchequer with that amount. And then the process of a teller's bill goes on and the tally stick being struck, etc. still continues. But it shows you that there's a very tight-knit relationship going on here between the bank system and the exchequer system. And indeed, statutes are written in the late 1700s, forcing paymasters to bank with the bank, basically forcing the system of close knit working and management of payments and receipts. So effectively, what happens at the exchequer is that it becomes a sinecure. 
it stops dealing in money because the money is being dealt with by the bank. And all that's happening is it's just an accounting house reporting receipts and payments. And it's the bank that's conducting all the payments on behalf of the exchequer. And so and what you find is that at the end of the business day, the bank clerks and the tellers will do a reckoning. And because the bank will accept, because it's doing what's known, as I mentioned earlier, the subscription for the circulation, what effectively is going on here is effectively the exchequer is issuing exchequer bills. And as far as the exchequer holding exchequer bills has a claim on the bank, the bank will cash any exchequer bill. So the exchequer has a claim on the bank and simultaneously the bank has a claim on the exchequer because the exchequer will cash bills as well. And so we're getting a really tight knit relationship whereby at the end of the day, the bank and the tellers of the exchequer will reckon either in the bank's notes or in exchequer bills. And so bank clerks will tot up all the money that they've received from the public accountants, and they'll tot up all the writs for payment that they've got to make on behalf of the tellers, and they'll come to a balance. And they'll either input money if it's in favour of the tellers, then they'll put Bank of England notes or exchequer bills into the exchequer chest, or alternatively, the tellers will pay the bank clerks the residual amount to the bank clerks and the bank clerks will take that back to the Bank of England at the end of the day. And so and this feeds into the modern system whereby we then abandon the exchequer chest, we abandon the tellers and we in 1834 we basically have the Bank of England making all payments for the government. We just, hey, let's write it down instead of like passing bits of yeah. paper <laughs> backwards and yeah. forwards. These could just be columns in, in say a book or something. Yeah, um, indeed. Yeah, and so... As I said earlier, the exchequer chest becomes the account of His Majesty's exchequer at the Bank of England. And that's it. So we're around the 1720s now, and there's a section in your chapter with the heading, A Sinking Feeling. And you write that a visceral desire to eliminate the national debt started up pretty much as soon as the first bank credit was issued. <laughs> Tell us about that section. Yeah, so we're talking about funds here, and this is interesting because this feeds into, I suppose, the nature of the national debt. So thinking about what the national debt and what it consisted of, concurrent with the incorporation of the Bank of England and then subsequently the East India Company and the South Sea Company and the permanent annuities that they were, i.e. they were effectively payments that the government had to make, which were just interest on the loans that these companies had made to the exchequer, that were paid for, effectively financed by ways and means, by the Acts of Parliament that incorporated these companies, also permitted His Majesty or Her Majesty the ability to raise revenue on duties, excise, you name it. And basically, those annuities were basically permanent, i.e., they couldn't be cancelled unless Parliament declared them cancelled. So they were basically there to run in perpetuity. And so all you had was basically the government taxing and just paying the interest on the capital, never paying off the capital. You then had also in that period what are known as terminable annuities. And you had, I think we mentioned possibly earlier on, tontines, which were another type of annuity, essentially. And these were terminable in the sense that at some point in the future, they ran for a certain period. And once they'd ran for that period, that was them cancelled and gone. There was no, as it were, payment of principle. It was purely interest. Okay, So this is what was known as funded debt. So the taxes that were raised by these Acts of Parliament were basically hypothecated, hoarded in certain funds. Okay, And these funds received money and then paid them out when the annuity payments were due. However, of course, sometimes they would have a surplus, okay? And those surpluses were then siphoned off into what were known as sinking funds. And the terminology here is the fact that obviously you float debt and to get rid of debt, you sink it, okay? So that's where the terminology comes from. So any surplus that was made on these funds after the annuities had been paid would be siphoned off into the sinking funds and then would be used to pay off some of the capital of some of these debt instruments, essentially. And so those were known as funded debt. Now, through time, a lot of these annuities were consolidated. And about mid-century, so mid-1700s, 
they became consoles were first issued. I think about 1751, 62, I can't remember exactly. And so they were consolidated government stock. And these were perpetual bonds. Again, the principle, the underlying capital of these things was never to be paid off. It was just the interest. So the question comes, and this was a great debate that took place later on, as to what the purpose of sinking funds were. Why are we paying off the principal of these instruments when the principal is never meant to be paid off? And we're actually classifying the national debt as the underlying capital of these instruments, when in fact we're not ever intending to pay the capital off. All we're doing is paying the interest. So isn't the national debt purely the interest on the principal, not the principal? And this was a debate that took place. And obviously it didn't win the day because we carried on having sinking funds right away into the 20th century. And indeed, I mean, I think when it came to the act that established the National Loans Fund was basically the end of sinking funds. I think they declared them basically, this is a complete waste of time. However, you could probably envisage the current system actually as an automatic sinking fund, the way it's run. So we have funded debt. We also have unfunded debt. When we talk about unfunded debt, we're saying that it's not funded by any Ways and Means Act, i.e. an act that raises taxes that's basically hypothecated for the paying off or the paying of interest on certain debt instruments. And a lot of those unfunded debts were exchequer bills. And it was exchequer bills that were consolidated into consoles. You then have floating debt, which is basically debt that requires paying off in an immediate period, as it were. So this is where sinking funds come from. It's the idea that we have these funds, and we have surpluses, and we can use the surpluses to pay off the underlying principle. But as I said, there was a great debate as to why we were doing that. And so in the early 1700s, you had various funds. You had things like the aggregate fund, the general fund, the South Sea fund, and you had sinking funds. So any surplus that arose on the former three were then pumped into the sinking fund and then paid off. But of course, it never really worked. So if we roll forward towards the sort of 1780s, another sort of watershed moment, there's a realisation within government at that time that the system that they're running is grossly inefficient, totally bloated and is not fit for purpose. And the government sets up a commission to investigate what is actually going on. Because at this time, it's important to understand that I think for about, probably about 60 years previous, possibly longer, they hadn't drawn up any accounts of government proper to show, well, what's our expenditure and what was the revenue? They just didn't do it. <laughs> like a little cottage industry that they'd started up and like, maybe this is important. Maybe we should keep track. <laughs> Precisely. And so what they found out was when they started investigating the system, they brought people in to give evidence. And so there are a group of reports. I'll just try and find the name of them. So this is, yes, a report of the commissioners appointed to examine, take and state the public accounts of the kingdom. And these started in 1780 under Edmund Burke, the great conservative, and basically they brought people in to give evidence. So I, they didn't have a clue what was going on. So can you tell me what's going on? And so they found that public accountants, i.e. paymasters and revenue receivers, were sitting on massive piles of cash that they were using for their own ends. And they weren't paying in and hadn't paid in and hadn't declared an account for decades. And so they decided that this whole system needed to be consolidated and basically reworked. And so this was the start of the reformation of the exchequer system. And this is where the consolidated fund comes from. So those three funds, the aggregate fund, the general fund, and South Sea fund, they were all amalgamated into the consolidated fund under an act of parliament. And the consolidated fund that we hold dear to death was inaugurated at that time. And before we move into that era and leave it behind, what finally ended the era of the tally sticks? So again, it was those reports, essentially. So it was those reports that were issued between 1780 and 1786. And there were about 22 of them in total. And they realised that the whole system was just a sinecure, i.e. it was doing nothing and achieved nothing and it needed fundamental reform. These are all 
bits of wood. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you indeed. Can just imagine. No, but when we spoke to Steve Keen about this, or oh, God, it's years ago now, it was middle of coronavirus time, he called the episode Revenge of the Tally Sticks. So they piled them all up in Parliament and, well, take it from there, Richard. That's right, yes. Yeah. So when they went through the evidence, minutes of evidence, etc., and they came to a conclusion, they decided that they would get rid of the tally stick system. But because the way that people were appointed to be officers within the Exchequer, actually within government, there were various ways that they could do it. You either had a life appointment or you had appointment by pleasure, etc., so tenure by pleasure, tenure to life or whatever. And so the Chamberlains in the Exchequer had a tenure by life. And so they had to actually wait until the Chamberlains died <laughs> before they could end the tally stick system, because that was their job, essentially. So they passed an act of parliament that basically said, we're going to end the tally stick system. But that was about 1787 or something. And it wasn't until 1826, when the last Chamberlain of the Exchequer died, that the tally stick system came to an end. Yeah, I think it, yeah, the receipt of the Exchequer Act, 1783, I think, yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's right, yeah. And so, effectively, that was in 1826, and when it came to the end of the Exchequer in 1834, as you said, and you've alluded to it, they obviously had piles and piles of these tally sticks, the foils of tally sticks, that, well, what do we do with them? And so they decided that they would put them in the flues underneath the Palace of Westminster and burn them. And, of course, they were so dry that they just burnt and they burned and burned and completely overheated the system. And then the whole Palace of Westminster caught fire and burned down. And that was the end of the tally stick and the Palace of Westminster. Yeah, that I think that there's that in the chapter you said, that was the last act of the tally stick was to give us the Palace of Westminster. And so we entered a new era in 1834, whereby, you know, as we've, what we've already discussed, that the Bank of England basically took over all of the payments for government via the account of His Majesty's Exchequer, essentially which still exists today. Yes, it's starting to resemble something that we recognise now. So bringing us into the modern era, you write about how during World War I, the British government borrowed US dollars. Why did the UK government need to borrow US dollars at that time? Well, I don't know specifically, but my guess is that it would be to purchase weapons of war, essentially, that the US were producing. That would be the obvious answer. And so what it did was it borrowed from American financiers, Wall Street bankers, essentially. And it's actually really interesting because I've recently investigated it. I actually read on Twitter a little tweet by, what's his name, Peter Hitchens. And he was talking about how the British government defaulted on these dollars that it borrowed. And that's true. It did default. But if you look into it, it's actually really interesting. And it's much more nuanced than that than how Peter Hitchens was putting it. We borrowed from American financiers, but eventually that debt was taken on, I understand, by the American government, and we owed the American government. Now, I can't remember off the top of my head what that figure was. I think it might have been to the tune of about £800 million. Pounds. Obviously quite a serious amount of money at the time. But there were various agreements that were meted out by the Allies at the end of the war. There was a Lausanne conference whereby there was a moratorium on British government payments to pay down this money for a year. And I've read Hansard reports on this period and later periods detailing the British government's position. Now, the British government was owed a serious amount of money by the French, the Germans, the Russians, the Italians and owed money to the Americans. And the position that I understand, and it came from a debate, as it was put out in Hensel, I'm trying to remember who was leading the debate, I can't remember, but the position was laid out in the fact that the British government expected the American government to agree that all of these debts owed, you know, intergovernmental debts would effectively be cancelled, given the fact that Europe was in a complete mess and needed heavy investment and reindustrialization and rebuilding after the war. And so the British government effectively agreed that the French, the Germans, we don't want your money, we'll just cancel everything because everybody agrees. Well, the American government didn't agree. And basically, it stated that, yeah, we kind of agree, but then it couldn't get the agreement through Congress, because Congress wouldn't agree to it, essentially. And so the debt stood. But the British government, in principle, 
stated that we don't agree with this and we're not going to pay because we don't think that that is the right thing to do, in essence. And so the debt still stands to this day, as far as I understand. I haven't seen, I've looked through the records and I can't see any payment of it. Now, whether it was rolled into debt that the British government then accumulated through World War II, I don't know. But again, I don't think so. And the reason I think that is because there's a 1966 Hansard precy of British government debt accrued in World War I to the United States government. And it says the debt in the 1960s still stands. It had obviously compound interest had taken over and it stood at about four and a half billion dollars. So I think that debt still stands. And I'm glad the British government didn't pay it off because I think that was the right thing to do. So that seems to me the, the position, as, as far as I understand. Again, I, if anybody's got any other information, then I'd be gratefully receive it. But I looked through the accounts and Peter Hitchens' position was he said that the government was bankrupt and couldn't pay. And I refute that because the government basically carried on making payments in US dollars, in gold, in silver, and would quite happily have carried on paying. In fact, there was a whole detailed system of payments that were sent to it by the American government that would have meant payment would have continued through until the 1970s. But the British position was that we don't think this is right and therefore we're not going to pay. And they made their last payment, I think, in about 1933. But it was only a token payment of, say, 7 million sterling or something. So jumping a few years ahead now then. So you write that in 1997, the then Labour government adopted a full funding rule. Tell us what that is. So a report, I think, was commissioned in mid-90s, so before the Labour government got in under the Conservative government, John Major. And it basically stated then that adopting a full funding rule would be the sensible course of action. Now, what do we mean by a full funding rule? We mean that government spends, government taxes and if taxes don't meet its spending, obviously there's been a net injection of money into the economy, which may affect monetary conditions. So fiscal policy interfering with monetary policy. And so the full funding rule was there to effectively drain the excess money over and above tax receipts so that government fiscal operations didn't affect monetary operations of the bank. Now, it wasn't obviously put into operation until Gordon Brown came into the Chancellor's position after 1997, and the rule was adopted then, and the rule is still in place, essentially. What was the political objective of that? I think what we were talking about here is the basically Britain joining the euro. Now, obviously, the thinking of the time, the doctrine of the time, was the fact that governments shouldn't interfere in monetary policy of banks, and so banks were becoming independent in terms of monetary policy, globally, and it was about all the European banks were in the process of converging to using the euro, and that was what I think underpinned the decision to go to the full funding. They were just basically adopting all the policies that other European governments and world governments were adopting. It was a global policy, and it fed into the doctrine that they live by. So was that to abide by Maastricht commitments, or was that to prepare to join the euro effectively? Yes, effectively to prepare to join the euro, but I'm sure it would have been Maastricht criteria. Now, I don't know the exact details, but effectively it was following the policy of all other European governments that were converging on the euro, essentially. And it was basically the separating out of monetary policy and fiscal policy. Fiscal policy had to be neutral as far as monetary policy was concerned. The budget needs to be balanced. So while we're talking about the 90s, obviously that's when governments around the world embraced central bank independence. What are your thoughts? On, I think I know the answer to this, but I'd like to hear your thoughts on monetarism and what drove its popularity, in your opinion. A misapprehension of the entire system, I think. You just can't control monetary aggregates. You can't control the quantity. You're in a floating system. Money is endogenous. And you can't control monetary aggregates. You have to use other tools if you want to control inflation. And of course, controlling inflation by using monetary aggregates or using interest rates, it's just nonsense. Yeah, I mean, obviously, we talk a lot about that on this podcast. And yeah, obviously, we're in complete agreement. And so I think I might be misinterpreting something here. But in your chapter, you write that the concept of reserves was introduced into UK banking for the first time in 2006. Am I reading that right? Yes. So they were formally called reserves from that point. Before then, 
They were called, as far as I understand, bankers' operational deposits. They weren't called reserves, but to all intents and purposes, they were reserves. So it's interesting. So if you go back in time, you, know, you go way back when, obviously, the nascent Bank of England and you had country banks in the countryside, no joint stock banks. They came later, again, by act of parliament. So they obviously issued notes as they lent and their customers went and spent those and into the economy. And obviously, they ended up in the possession of people who banked with other country banks, who would then go to their country banks and say, well, okay, I've got a, a note here from the Bank of I don't know, Birmingham, and obviously you're the Bank of Bristol, for example. The Bank of Bristol would take them on, but then they would have a claim on the Bank of Birmingham. So what you find is that these banks also take in Bank of England notes. And so when the Bank of Bristol has a claim on the Bank of Birmingham. It goes to the Bank of Birmingham and says, here's your note. Do you want it back? And in return, can I have some Bank of England notes, please? And so they start transacting amongst themselves, settling payments as their customers are paying in each other's bills and settling with each other in Bank of England bills. And this is how the system eventually came into being today, i.e. bankers having accounts at the Bank of England using Bank of England reserves or bankers' operational deposits to make payments and settle payments amongst each other as their customers are transacting. So this is how, again, how that system came to be. But it was only in 2006 when I think the naming of reserves is adopted. So yeah, my understanding was bankers' operational deposits prior to that. Again, we stand to be created. So look into the future. At the end of your chapter, you round off by saying that we have an overly complex exchequer system with monetary policy, the dominant economic management tool, which here we are, of course, very critical of. How would you change things if you were in charge? In charge for a day. Okay. So I would abolish the debt management office because that is a sinecure, essentially. It's a modern equivalent of the exchequer back in 1834. That Because the Bank of England pay interest on reserves, you don't need the debt management office doing what it does, essentially. And it's just, it's a dead system. It doesn't need to happen. So you can get rid of gilt sales and treasury bills. We can just end that and we could effectively use the system at the Bank of England, the Ways and Means account, to utilize it and just charge the government deficit to it. We don't need to be dealing in guilt sales and treasury bill sales anymore. So the debt management office goes. You could have a debate about the Bank of England. Do you need the Bank of England? Because we know that it's possible to set up a system, because the history tells us so, that you can basically make the exchequer into a bank. That would be a possibility, but maybe not this time around. I would, I mean, this is probably quite so topical, I guess, I would extend deposit insurance to just fully cover all deposits, essentially. And basically, banks that take risks and excessive risks such that they undermine their capital base uh, would be taken into administration by the Bank of England and sorted out. And so that would try and act as a way of controlling banks from taking too much risk. Yeah, maybe you could just say, you're a failing bank, congratulations, the nation now has a new public bank. Yeah, precisely. Yeah, indeed. I would go for permanent zero interest rates, essentially on public money, and then you let the private system work out interest rates based upon proper risk analysis, the stuff that they should be doing. I would reform the pension system and I would extend the national NSNI, National Savings and Investments, to include pension annuities. So you could gain an annuity via NSNI rather than going privately. On the spend side, taking the sort of Q from MMT, you have to inaugurate a job guarantee system as the major stabiliser. So having put interest rates to zero, you're no longer using monetary policy. We know it doesn't work. So you use a spend side automatic stabiliser as a job guarantee. Heavy investment into public services, research and development, education, public health, infrastructure, probably renationalisation of strategic resources, energy, rail, that type of thing. Invest heavily in housing. I think that would be another one because obviously we have a housing crisis. House prices are way out of whack and need to in some way be controlled. So there's a kind of soft landing, as it were. On the tax side, you could probably simplify the tax system, have a more targeted and progressive tax system, obviously come down heavily on avoidance and evasion. You might 
think about, and this is a, perhaps a controversial one, but and again, taking cue from MMT, you probably want to abolish corporation tax because there's a lot of distortion that goes on with corporation tax. And in doing that, you're more focusing on taxing costs rather than profits. I think that's one of Neil Wilson's big things. I think he writes about that in his tax chapter. What would you replace it with? You would tax their costs, essentially. So you would basically, you would say, increase employers' national insurance. Because the, obviously the point of taxation is to effectively create unemployment such that you can buy those unemployed resources and put them to work in the public sector. That would be my view. Great stuff. That's a great place to leave it. We've been talking to Richard Tai, one of the contributors to MMT Key Insights Leading Thinkers. And we'll link to where you can get hold of that book in the show notes for this episode, along with a link to where you can get free tickets to its launch, which will feature heavily discounted books and author presentations. Richard will be there answering audience questions as well. It takes place in London on Thursday, the 20th of April. We'll be there. We hope to see you guys there. But for now, thanks so much for joining us once again today on the MMT podcast, Richard Ty. Thanks very much. It's been a pleasure. That was the MMT Podcast with Patricia Pino and Christian Riley. Don't forget, you can support the show through Patreon, starting at a dollar a month and get access to patron-only episodes. You can do that by going to patreon.com slash MMT Podcast. You can also find me on Twitter at MMT Podcast, and you can find Patricia on Twitter at Patricia N. Pino. And you can email us at mmtpodcast at outlook.com. Thanks for listening, and we hope to hear from you.